Okay, so let's go back to the beginning. You joined the BBC as a radio producer in 1974, still very much in the traditional era of pioneering senior leadership of Hugh Carlton Green, Bill Cotton and David Croft. In what ways could you see a sea change on the horizon? Oh gosh, I don't think we had any idea what was gonna happen. Um, the BBC seemed to have been there forever and it seemed solid and very uh, sure of itself. You know, that was the hallmark of the BBC in those days. People sometimes say it was very patrician and very white, but the principles laid down by Lord Reith all those years ago were very, um, you know, they were very strong. The BBC, we believed in, we believed in what we did. We were all paid half of what people got from, you know, independent, uh, broadcasters and we were proud of that you know we were proud of the fact that you if you had a BBC identity card that would get you in free to any museum in the world and it was a mark of respect you know um, and that self-confidence sadly is sort of gone really BBC is nervous you know very beleaguered um, and really I think all the way through uh, my time of the certainly the 70s and the 80s you know uh, the BBC felt it was doing a good job and the country agreed with it you know uh, and there was although governments of every hue have always you know hated the BBC when you're in power and you get held to account you hate it and of course when you're in opposition you like them uh, and it's about about balance but um Sorry, it's not a very funny answer that, but it's something I feel really strongly about. And it's a shame that, you know, that what one of the differences really with the modern BBC is that BBC was a very creative organization. And you mentioned, you know, Bill Cotton was a wonderful light entertainment producer. Hugh Carlton Green was a highly creative guy and that's the way it worked. And, and because, the BBC was run by creative people. They recognise that creative people don't need to be micromanaged. You find the best people you can, and then you let them get on with it, which is the way you know that I was trained. And Josh will have got that impression, I'm sure, when listening to Paul and uh, Beryl um, and everyone on the on the comedy controllers thing. Is that if you were a BBC producer, they used to say, "Is any two jobs worth having in the BBC?" One is the director general and the other is a producer. And so everything was very broadly based and producers were expected to take complete responsibilities for everything, all the legals, all the replying to, you know, angry listeners and viewers, um, you were trusted. And, and if you screwed up, then you were bollocked, but basically you were let be. I mean, on a slightly more amusing note, they used to say, how many people work at the BBC? And the answer is about half of them because <laughs> because you know the thing is like in every large organization there are time serving people and the people who drive it forward is actually quite a small percentage um although i think the hallmark of the bbc certainly in those days was competence you know because of that thing that you were you were trained by trial and error. You learned on the job. You were you were left alone. And my goodness, when you made a mistake, you certainly didn't forget it. And now what we have is a system of referral upwards. So nobody takes responsibility for everything. Everyone's always referring upwards so that somebody else more senior to them will take responsibility, which is a disaster. And actually, since that sort of came in in the mid 90s, the BBC's made more mistakes than than it ever did before because it, it's a it's a basic principle of management i believe is you know hire the best people you can afford and then trust them and if they screw up fire them yeah. that's really management in a nutshell whereas now what it is is right everyone's got to do a lot of form filling to get in and when they do get in they're not allowed to do what they came to do they're told what to do or criticized or you know belittled or told that they aren't senior enough to do things it's it's really it's really a shame that it's it's got to that but that isn't that isn't a bbc problem that's a a national possibly even an international problem which is that's true of the banking industry or the army or the police you know that everything is about fail safe management everyone's so frightened of making a mistake 
that they put these controls in place so that people can't, everything's government by committee and, um, you know, famously the great acronym, a hippo, everybody in a business meeting, a modern business meeting is waiting for a hippo to come along. And that's an acronym standing for higher paid person's opinion. So everyone is saying nothing until the boss has said, I think we should do this. And everyone goes, great idea, sir. Or yeah. <laughs> you know, it's kind of a crazy, crazy system. And, um, you know, I think you can see it even in modern politics now, you know, that you've got, you know, basically nobody shoulders the blame. Nobody ever says in politics, the buck stops here. I'm the prime minister or the president. They go, oh, it was their fault. You know, it was the Mexicans or it's the public, you know, it's the public have been irresponsible with COVID. It's nothing to do with, you know, the government policy. Absolutely. <laughs> Did you think that changed in the nineties? Yeah, um, it started. It started really. Uh, <clears throat> well, I'm saying, given that this is a global problem, and it all starts from good motives, which is on the grounds of efficiency and democracy, and you know, putting control systems in place. But for the BBC, it really started when they called in management consultants, McKinsey, I think it was, for some enormous amount of money to tell them how they do it. And, you know, management consultancies are the bane of management because one of my favorite stats is that the share prices of all the major management consultancy firms, the big five as they're called, all massively outperform the share prices of the companies they uh, actually advise. So it's a brilliant business model. They're making a lot of money, basically giving not very good advice because the advice they give doesn't produce an increase in profits in the companies they're advising, but it gives them a great deal of profit. Profit. Yeah. In 1979, you created Not the Nine O'Clock News. What do you think it was about the socioeconomic structure of the late 1970s which made the show hit such a chord with a certain demographic? <laughs> well, good question, Josh. Um, <clears throat> okay, well, uh, basically, uh, what happened in 79, uh, when I turned, I was very cross. I'd resigned from BBC Radio in a tr terrific temper because I'd been sacked from The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy by my best friend, Douglas Adams. I'd invented a, helped co-invented a show called To the Manor Born with a guy called Pete Spence, who was a great friend, which went to television without me. And I lost my temper and said, OK, I don't do this anymore. I worked so hard. I was taking home 40 sitcoms every weekend and a wheelbarrow because I was the departmental script editor. I was absolutely exhausted at the age of 27. And so I quit and turned up at the office of Jimmy Gilbert, the head of Light Entertainment and John Howard Davis, his number two, the head of comedy, looking for a job as a production manager, uh, which my careers officer at the BBC had said I wouldn't get because I was much too old. Um, and they got, gave me this opportunity to do six shows as a producer. I, I really couldn't believe it. I had no expectation of it. And they said, well, you know, we've been waiting for you to come and knock on the door, but you obviously, if you haven't got the courage to come and ask, we weren't going to ask you first. So, so they put me together with this great guy, Sean Hardy from Current Affairs and gave us an office. Um, and we sat down to think about what a new kind of comedy show would be. And the things, somebody, somebody very high up at the BBC, probably Brian Wenham, the controller of BBC Two, had gone to Light Entertainment and said, look, you haven't really done anything new in Light Entertainment for 10 years. The last really exciting thing was Monty Python, which is exactly 10 years before 69. And then since Python finished three years later, you know, you basically got brilliant shows but you know porridge the two ronnies you know dave allen they're all great but they've basically been running for decades almost you know and so they wanted something a bit more cutting edge and so sean and i sat down and you know with many of the great writers who are now famous who were then some young radio writers mostly sat down to think what to look at the world and how comedy could 
reflect it better because I often used to say in the two Ronnies, for example, if people go to a party, they wear blazers with gold buttons, cavalry twill trousers, and they have cravats, and they're all very polite and so on. And think, well, yeah, my parents probably look a bit like that, but that's not the kind of party I go to. You know, the kind of party I go to is in Camden Lock, everybody's in leather jackets and scuffed jeans, cowboy boots, you know, we're all probably smoking dope um, and certainly drinking a lot and, you know, People are sort of rough edged and, you know, the 70s was a, a down and dirty decade. You know, there was the beginning of urban terrorism. You've got, you know, the Baden-Meinhof gang. You've got, uh, you know, Britain being the sick man of Europe, the worst economy in Europe, um, the, the three day week, you know, everything's a mess. London's covered in rubbish. Um, and you've got the beginning of punk rock in 76. You've got the Face magazine. So it's, you know, it's urban, it's gritty, it's shabby, it's great fun, we're all young, and we wanted a show that reflected that, our perspective on it. So again, the two Ronnies, when the two Ronnies went to the pub, they played Shove Hapney, you know, a game that we'd ba barely never heard of, you know, or Skittles. When we went to the pub, we played Space Invaders, you know, and so we did actually have as part of the contract a Space Invaders machine in the rehearsal room when Not the Nine O'Clock News started. <laughs> and then later on, Mel and Griff got interested in pinballs. So we had a pinball machine as part of the contract. Again, you'd never get that past anyone now because it's not, it's not apparently showing value. I mean, that, if that appeared on the budget, you'd be fired, you know? <laughs> but actually, of course, what it meant was it kept people happy while people were arguing about the funny lines. They could play pinball and they, the productivity shot up, in fact. So all those things about not the nine o'clock news, you know, television is rather like advertising, is actually extremely slow to, to reflect actual, uh, actual cultural differences in society at large. It's years behind, usually. Um, and so we basically kind of reflected the story of our lives, you know. A phone box in the two Ronnies is a place you go to make a phone call. In Not the Nine O'Clock News, it's a lavatory, you know. You open the door and somebody's <laughs> chat in the corner, use the, use the telephone book as loo paper, mm -hmm. and then there's a queue of people having waiting to go for a wee in it, you know. That's what, you know, that's a very good joke, but it was essentially the way we saw things. So it it was, and this is a, a way of peeling off the layers of, you know, received wisdom and cliche that everybody else is doing. So, for example, with doctors, you know, uh, I often say that if people went to the doctor as often as they go to the doctor and the two Ronnies, we'd be very sick indeed, you know, because doctor sketches are a staple of comedy. And of course, the doctor in the 70s was always a bloke. And I remember when we first said, well, why doesn't Pamela play the doctor? You know, is Griff going to the to doctor and we'll make Pamela the doctor and put her in a white coat and all that, you think? And it was such a radical thing, you know, to do that because nobody else was doing it. That wouldn't have happened in Monty Python or in, in the two Ronnies. Um, and I thought, this is ridiculous. My GP's a woman. She's always been a woman. Why do I think it's so odd? In a comedy sketch, it, it's often quite difficult with the writers to say that won't be funny because it's not the cliche. You've got to basically give somebody someone to stand. So then we just, you know, fighting against the common wisdom, Pamela played barristers, you know. Again, people go, oh, a woman barrister, that's weird. You, one forgets, you know, how, how radical it was in the late 70s that, you know, that all the things that now you'd be embarrassed to some of the radio shows that I produced in the 70s, the sort of jokes that we did, that everyone did, they all thought they were harmless, you know, sort of, you know, gay camp jokes and, you know, fat jokes and mother-in-law jokes. It wasn't considered, it wasn't like anyone was being radical. They just, that was just the kind of sense of humor. Basically the sense of humor kind of came from the right all the way through the 70s. And the common wisdom was that left-wing people aren't funny because they're all, you know, vegans and, you know, they're all serious and they believe in, you know, 
I don't know, um, socialism and stuff. And, and it all swung around in the late 70s, partly because of Not The Nine and partly because of the comedy store and the comic strip of thinking, hang on, it's possible to have a sense of humor and not to be a Tory, you know, which was a totally new thing. And now of course it's gone the other way too far. You know, there's only one right wing comedian in the country who gets any work that anyone's heard of who's wheeled out for every sort of, you know, have I got news for you? Because, you know, the common comedians generally are, you know, liberal minded people. And they weren't in the seventies. They were working men's clubs and it was, you know, you had to be 55 and you had to be either a northerner or a Scot or a northern Irishman. And that was, and everyone had a, you know, they had a common take on things. And, and now it's, as I say, it's rather gone overbalanced the other way. Comedians tend to be young, they tend to be lefty. Um, and that's not healthy either. You know, you need a diversity of plurality of views. And so we, we applied what we saw to everything, politics too, so that one of the great insights early on with Not The Nine was that, you know, the cl comedy cliche is that, you know, uh, the Labour Party are all, you know, like this. They come from the North and they're all very dull and, you know, a bit bureaucratic. And, you know, Tories are frightfully upper class and they all have grouse moors and, you know, they're, you know they all talk like that. <laughs> and I remember Sean and I looking at the thing, but this isn't, this isn't what modern politics is like. Norman Tebbit, you know, who's the employment secretary, he was a member of a trade union. You know, he was a, he was a, he ran Balpa, the airline pilots union. He talked a bit like that. Whereas Dennis Healy, who is a judge of the Exchequer, you know, Oxford educated and a friend of Roy Jenkins, and you know, very interested in opera and classical music and so forth. And it had all gone round, it had all turned upside down. So suddenly the Tories were, you know, lower middle class, you know, ambitious, and the and the Labour Party were all, you know, ludicrous people from, you know, the, the ivory towers of Oxford. And I remember saying to the writers, this is what we've got to do. And they said, well, it won't be funny because people rely on Labour Party members have whippets and flat caps, you know, and eat black pudding. And the Tories are all wah, wah, wah. I said, but it's not true anymore. Mm -hmm. The prevailing wind is different. And so that kind of thing, and it's say, often terribly difficult to get people to think outside those set of cliches and, and to create something fresh. And my goodness, it, you know, to this day, you know, sometimes I look at old sketches, you see them going past when you're, you know, half cut online late at night, you know, and you think that is a, that's really good that. Even today, it still feels, you know, quite, you know, quite up to the minute. Yeah. Yeah, it's like you know what our next question is before we even asked it. <laughs> hey, what? You, you've touched on a few questions already, but we'll carry on as as, as we were anyway. Yeah. Uh, Okay, this coincided with the opening of the Comedy Store in May 1979. How did producers of your generation go about finding the stars of the alternative comedy circuit a suitable TV platform? Well, you know, uh, I, went, I went to see the Comedy Store right at the beginning. It might even even been the opening night. And Clive Anderson was doing a turn and he used to do a sort of, you know, as a sort of joke, really turn up as a barrister in a pinstripe suit and be very, you know, different to the people with, you know, safety pins through their noses and things. And he said, ladies and gentlemen, we have got what a treat. We've got a very famous uh, television producer here with us, John Lloyd. And I think this is ridiculous. I mean, I've, en I've only been in the building five minutes you know we'd hardly done any uh, any stuff I think just one series and I got heck heckled by Keith Allen you know turncoat yeah middle class fucker and afterwards um, we all went to the bar and 
Keith ripped a radiator off the wall and jammed me in a lift with it. <laughs> Hang on, guys, I'm just like you. I'm, you know, similar age, you know, I'm in my 20s and I come from a similar perspective. Already we were seen as the enemy, you know, because we were actually on television. So we weren't radical enough, you know, we weren't enough of an outsider. So really those guys were, it was quite a while before I got to know people like Rick, for example, by the time this had been like three or four years later when I was doing Blackadder when, you know, they'd, uh, you know, again, the establishment, BBC among them, has a way of assimilating people quite quickly into, into the mainstream. It's one of the, one of the ways that we stop revolutions in this country is that, you know, um, the school bully is simply promoted to be head of house, basically, you know, that we, we out nice people. You to get people like the young ones come along, which was, you know, so the young ones were making their first series when the last series of Not the Nine O'Clock News is being made. And that was very radical for its time too. But I remember after they were, they were successful very quickly. The first series of the young ones was a huge hit and they were asked to the BBC Light Entertainment Christmas party, you know, where you would see the two Ronnies and Dave Allen and, you know, all the Jimmy Tarbuck and all the great comics of the day. And um, so young ones, we all thought they were going to come, you know, and they were all really gone for it. And they dressed up in proper black tie. They looked amazing. We didn't expect that. We thought they'd all, you know, come in shorts or something. And uh, Roly Riveron, the drummer of uh, the band in The Young Ones, uh, decided that he was going to, this is all a bit too stiff for him. So he unzipped his flies and took his willy out and let it hang out of his, his dinner jacket. <laughs> we were standing around talking. And Gareth Gwenlin, who was then the head of uh, comedy in succession to John Howard Davison, was known as head of white hair because he had a head of white hair, so the head of white hair, head of comedy. Uh, he was, he, he joined the group and we were all standing around. Everyone was thinking, God, Roly, put your dick away. This is ridiculous. But there he was hanging out, you know, <laughs> like a sort of sausage. And, uh, and Gareth <laughs> clocked this um, thing and he thought, all right, I'm going to get out of here. So he said, would anyone like a drink? I'm going to the bar. <laughs> and he turned to go and Roly said, uh, Gareth, and Gareth had to turn around and there was Roly with his willy hanging out. And he said, yes, I'd try white wine, please. <laughs> that was one of the funniest things I've ever seen. But you see already they were, you know, within a year, they were, you know, brought into the establishment really quite quickly. So we didn't, we made all sorts of mistakes, Sean and I, with casting, particularly the, what became known as the pilot of Not the Nine News was actually the first of the, series and we cast you know we thought we've got to have famous people so we cast people we didn't know often people much older than us and then when that was cancelled because of the general election of 1979 we went and basically cast friends people we already knew or, or knew knew of who were of similar generation Ronnie Barker allegedly took offence to a sketch parody of the two Ronnies on Not the Nine O'Clock News. In what ways do you think this signaled the start of a sea change in British comedy? And how did you feel about his reaction? Well, um, so the, the, the way this came about is that Ronnie Barker had written a piece in the paper saying that not the nine o'clock news had gone too far and we were all too rude and we, you know, we basically crossed a line. And I thought, well, I grew up with the two Ronnies. I think they're hilarious. We all adulated them. We thought they were absolutely brilliant. But so I thought, well, I don't think we're that rude. The thing about not the nine o'clock news, it wasn't rude all the time. When it was rude, it was very rude and it was very honest. You know, would you like to rub my tits too? Just, oh. Whereas the two Ronnies was rude nearly all the time. It's just, it was done in code, you know, it was all innuendo. So I went and watched the two Ronnies to reassure myself of this. And I counted in one episode, 54 references to genitals, you know, cobblers, bouncers, ghoulies, you know, all that stuff. Either, either excremental things, you know, it, it'll, it, 
it'll be cool in Ghoul. And if, if you live in, live in Lissing Down, it'll be absolutely, you know, wet. You know, you, you, don't, you know, it's all strings and strings of naughty puns. I love it, you know, my favorite stuff. But the idea that they were somehow incredibly clean and family orientated and we were filthy and, you know, shouldn't be allowed was ridiculous. And the sketch, basically written by a disaffected two Ronnies writer who'd got a bit fed up with the things as quite often. And, you know, it was a very silly, funny and truthful thing. And reports had it that Ronnie Barker was very cross and decided he wouldn't sign his contract again, but Ronnie Corbett thought it was hilarious. So who knows? I mean, I'm glad I don't have to work in satire these days. I, I wouldn't be able to do that kind of thing. But in those days, when you're nobody, you think that famous people have, you know, a thick skin and they wouldn't even know you were doing it. And that's the way of the world. You know, young journalists come along and they write nasty articles about famous people thinking they don't have any feelings or they won't read the piece. And of course, the famous people haven't changed. They get hurt just as easily as anyone else. And of course, we, you know, we really respected Ronnie Barker and we were a bit, well, we we're first of all, a bit hurt by the article and then obviously a bit taken aback that he had taken it so seriously, really. Yeah. Something which I always find remarkable about your career is besides your substantial contributions to alternative comedy, you also produced the beloved sitcom To The Manor Born, which arguably became a BBC family favourite during the late 70s and 80s. How did this experience help to teach you the disciplines that you developed further in subsequent years? <clears throat> well, Pete uh, Spence, who wrote To the Man of Born, was a very close friend of mine. I'm godfather to his daughter. And, um, and we used to hang out a lot together. And we decided that we were going to write the perfect sitcom. We we're going to create the perfect sitcom from scratch. And so rather like with me and Sean and not the nine o'clock news, we sat down and think, well, what is a sitcom about? It's about people who are trapped in a circumstance usually not of their own devising. They can't escape for various reasons. It may be because of a job or because they have any money or because they're related to somebody and so on. And so we sat down and thought, right, all right, so what are the issues The money, class? Anyway, so we put this, it took about two years uh, with Pete doing the writing and me making suggestions and, and eventually we came up with this script, which we were both very proud of and Pete, Pete said, let's send it to Penelope Keith. And you think, well, that's an absurd idea. She's probably the most famous actress in the country at the moment. She was huge in the West End and the good life had been huge. And what were the chances, you know? Anyway, we sent her the script and she got, Asian got straight back saying she loves it. She'd like to do it. So we put a pilot together with a guy called Bernie Braden, because in those days uh, before Peter Bowles came along, we thought one of the differences would be she's very English and he's actually Canadian, but playing an American, a rich American. Uh, and so um, the, uh, we started uh, putting this together and I phoned my booker and I said, you won't believe this. We've got Penelope Keith to star in this pilot. And she goes, who? I said, Penelope Keith? Now this woman, of course, she's a radio booker. So she's focusing on what happens in radio. She says, I'm, she hasn't done any radio work for years. I don't really think we can pay her very much. And I said, but no, she's not done any radio work because she's enormous on, you know, telly and in advertising and then in the West End. Anyway, she hadn't heard of her apparently. So she offered her a fee of 60 pounds, which was half what Roy Hudd was getting on the news headlines which is ridiculous, but she wanted to do the pilot very much. So she did it. It went very well. And immediately she said, John, I can't work for 60 pounds a week. I'm taking this to telly and Pete's coming with me. So off they did and off they went. And, you know, the rest is history. That the Christmas special after the first series got 27 million viewers, which was the highest audience for any kind of drama or comedy that had ever been on television in Britain. You know, it was up there with sort of the Olympics and things like that, which is extraordinary. So it was immediately a hit. And I did, Pete Spence said, well, why don't you, why don't you come with me as a co-writer? And I said, well, I've I got a, you know, I've got a job. So I used to go down to his house at 
in Dorking at the weekends and try and write with him, but it didn't work. We had a great producer writer relationship, but it didn't really work the two of us as writers, you know, it changed the sort of chemistry of things. So he went off and jolly good luck to him because he's a great guy. In 1983, you produced the first series of Blackadder, which surprisingly almost didn't get recommissioned. In your opinion, what didn't work and what impact did Ben Elton have over its future success? <clears throat> well, um, as Josh probably knows, if he's done the research, I mean, I've been fired a lot of times by people and, and I'm very grateful that I am because it keeps you, it keeps you ordinary, you know, it keeps you from getting too big headed. But actually, when we set out to make that first series of Blackadder, we got a bit cocky, you know, we'd done four series of Not The Man Clock News, me and Rowan and Richard. And we, of course, we all thought we knew something, which you do when you're young and foolish. We'd won a couple of BAFTA awards, you know, and we thought, well, we know better than everybody else. So we don't want an audience because that limits what we can do. And so we made the sets too big to fit in the audience with the bleachers and the sets at the same time. And Rowan decided he wanted to be John Cleese. And so he wanted to write it, even though Rowan hadn't written a single word for Not the Nine O'Clock News. And he writes the best thank you letters in the world, Rowan. He's famous for it, but that's his skill. He doesn't write comedy. Richard writes the comedy and Rowan performs it. That's how it worked. And so that was very slow. The scripts are very late. We had a very new director who was really out of his depth. Um, we had over ambitious, we had huge sets, we had vast crew, you know, vast cast of extras and dogs and horses. And uh, so it's just oh, it's a nightmare. I mean, we really uh, didn't know what we were doing. And so we struggled through this thing because it didn't have an audience, of course. Um, you could sort of, you could indulge yourself with the editing. The editing took five months to do. It was crazy. And it was got so out of hand that some of the actors had died by the time it actually got, got to air. Mm. Um, uh, and, and it was a, but we, it was all right. You know, we, we pulled it together. People often say it's not as good as the others. And there's, there's some truth in that because basically our guys were all stage comics and they were used to timing their audience to an actual audience. And they had no, didn't know how to do film acting. So the timing's all slow. And then when we delivered it, my boss, John Hard Davis says, well, he said, I don't know if it's funny. John. And it was meant to be very dark. We liked the idea that it was sort of very dramatic and a bit scary, but he couldn't see whether it was funny or not. So he made us show the cut programs to a live audience. So that's one of the reasons it sounds very odd because it keeps, we kept having to turn the laughter down. They laughed a lot to stop, you know, going over the next line. Um, so it sounds very odd. But I have to say, it did win an international Emmy, that first series, so it wasn't that bad. Um, but anyway, yes, it was, it wasn't just, it was not nearly, it was cancelled. Uh, Michael Grade came in, hot from where did he come from, Channel 4, I suppose, and cancelled it. He looked at the budget and he looked at the ratings and he saw, well, it doesn't stack up at all. It's, it was known in the BBC bar as the series that looked like a million dollars, but cost a million pounds. That was in the days when a pound was worth $2, which it isn't now, but you know, so it was canceled. And, and I said, um, uh, well, you know, we're, we've already learned our lesson. Ben had come on board by that stage. We've, it's a completely different thing. We'd already written four of the scripts and they were really good. And so I said, look guys, it's a money problem here. It's not that we're not funny enough, it's the money versus the ratings. So we spent this really difficult weekend looking at the scripts and cutting out every prop, every dog, every horse, no guards, you know, no, um, no big sets. And it's one of the reasons why the set in the second series, uh, Queenie's uh, Room, you know, she's living in a tiny room, like a, a, a teenager's bedroom, because we didn't have the money to have a bigger room. And so that's where the idea came that she is like a teenager. She's got a nanny. She's just a spoiled brat. But you don't notice. That's the weird thing. You don't notice there aren't guys in suits of armor standing around and guards and crowd scenes. It seems to you sort of suspend the disbelief, don't you? 
Wasn't Peter Cook in the first series? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> there were also all sorts of people in the first series. I think they really felt like a fish out of water. And because, you know, we'd kind of developed um, this style of working, which is sort of ahead of its time in a way, but it was, it's that thing of working closely with the writers and the actors and changing the script and mucking around in rehearsal. Um, Python did that, but few other people. And so, as you may have seen clips of people arguing about every single word of not just every line of the thing. And so when we had professional actors like Wilfred Bramble, you know, the senior Steptoe from Steptoe and Son came for a small part. And after listening to us argue about three lines for four hours, he left. He said, I, this is ridiculous. It's the most unprofessional bunch of idiots I've ever met. And, and I said, oh, please, Mr. Bramble, please just bear with us. No, no, he wasn't having any of it. So, um, yeah. Uh, yes, we, it's, it's, it's a shambolic um, system in a way, but it does work. And that's the thing that, again, Blackadder stands up, doesn't it? You look at it now, you think, oh, oh, all I can remember is how painful it was to do in some ways. And actually, now I remember what fun it was to. And, you know, uh, but I, you know, it's one of my core bits of philosophy that if it isn't difficult, it's probably not going to be any good. When I uh, when uh, Josh interviewed Ben Alton last year, uh, Ben Alton actually said that was the magic. The magic of it was that they wrote separately. They wrote yeah, yeah, yeah. But they, that's right. They would agree um, a, a, a period with with me having some say in that. Not my, very much usually. And then they would divide up. They would think of six episode subjects and they'd go and write three of them each and then they'd swap over. But don't make the mistake of thinking it was like just like that and then the scripts turned up and that's the that's the ones you see on screen because for a start, Richard and Ben disagreed with almost every line of each other. So they would go backwards and forwards, rewriting each other. And I would get then, you know, this peculiar script that would be, you could, almost color code it with a magic marker. That's obviously a Ben line and that's a Richard line. So a Ben line would be, you know, get your knob out and Richard's would be a tiny wee nosy, you know? <laughs> and so, well, this doesn't really work guys because it's like, it's, a, it's got, you know, there's two personalities talking here at the same time. And we have to make this so that one actor can make something of it so that it's the same person talking. Mm. And a lot of, you know, a lot of grumpiness. I mean, this is, we've talked about this plenty of times. We're all very good friends now, but at the time it was, it, it was tricky because um, they didn't want the actors to change their lines, you know? And on the other hand, the actors were not gonna say those lines because they were, you know, Tony Robinson and uh, Hugh Laurie and Stephen Fry. These are very good writers in their own right. And they just, they were competitive and they weren't gonna say that line. It wasn't funny enough because it's not as funny as the one Hugh's got. So a lot of argy bargy went on. And again, the only justification for it is that 30 years on, nobody complains about that. They just say, yeah, I'm glad. I had a great chat with Richard about it the other day. So we're so lucky, aren't we, that it's lasted so well. I said, well, I mean, not really luck, actually. It's because a lot went into it. But, um, and, you know, there's still to this day people, which I think is, you know, you, I, I can never remember who wrote what line, quite honestly, but people are still arguing about who wrote life as a twisty, turny thing. You twist and turn like a twisty, turny thing. You know, they're still arguing about who wrote it. I mean, I really don't see why anyone cares, but there you are. <laughs> 
Just a year later, you switched sides to ITV to produce the satirical juggernaut spitting image. To what extent was the network doubtful about mocking the establishment? And in what ways did spitting image reinvent the art of satire for the modern world? Um, well, we'd taken a sort of half built puppet and a bunch of photographs of Fluck and Law's work down run to almost every ITV company in the country, I think, maybe not Channel Islands and Border, but every, all the others. And they'd all said, no, puppets are for children. You must be mad. This is never going to work. And it's far too expensive. And then we went to Central Television. Charlie Denton, the wonderful program controller, said, I'll take 26. You think, what? Well, we can't, we haven't got enough puppets to do 26. Well, can we do 13 with a break in the middle? So he said, okay. So he, he was absolutely behind us. He's a very, very good producer in his own right. Um, but yeah, there was anxiety uh, up further up upstairs but don't forget you're much safer off doing that kind of thing at ITV than you are at you know the BBC because if you if you're seen as too radical you get all the politicians weighing in and um, you know all the other ITV complaining you shouldn't have as big a budget because it's you know whereas ITV you uh, nobody really cares you know and it's a commercial proposition and you live or die by your success um, so it's a bit of a shock when we cut together the first episode and it had six minutes of royal jokes in it. And Charlie, the program controller, called us the team, you know, there the were three producers there were, and the two, Fluck and Law, into his office and said, guys, I'm really sorry, but no royal jokes. Uh, the board have told me all the royal jokes have to, what, well, all the jokes? Well, why? So I can't say why, but you have to take them all out. I'm really sorry. And you've got to decide tonight because basically either you cut them out and you go on to fight another day and we can argue about it all next week and going forward, or you insist the jokes stay and I have to pull the program. And that will be the end of Spitting Image. So we were very, very upset and angry, you can imagine. And he, such a great guy brought a bottle of whiskey out of the cupboard, stuck it on the table and said, have a drink lads and let me know when you've decided. So we sat and drank this whiskey for about two hours and there was a lot of shouting and, you know, a doubt and all that kind of anguish. And eventually we decided by a majority of all of us, I think we all decided, all right, let's, let's uh, bite the bullet, let's cut the stuff out and let's have another go next week. So we did it, it went out. Um, you know, to terrible reviews, I have to say. Um, and the next week, they said, all right, you can put them all back in again now. So we used all that material we'd shot the previous week and stuck it in the second program. And the reason for it was, was that Prince Philip was going to open the company's Nottingham, new Nottingham studios uh, during that week, and they didn't want to upset him. Because uh, then he would have not opened the studios. Not that he'd have cared, Prince Philip, I'm sure, but that was it, you know. So <laughs> that was about the size of the political interference. And then later on, Robert Maxwell, um, the late lamented, was on the board of Central Television. And we had done this, again, I thought sometimes they overdid it, the puppet people, the um, puppet makers. It was a sketch where everything Robert Maxwell touched turned to shit. Instead of like Croesus, everything turned to gold when he touched it. Everything he had to sandwich, and suddenly there'd be poo everywhere. <laughs> That's a table to poo. It was brilliant. The tech, technical way they did it was absolutely brilliant, but it was thoroughly disgusting. And I thought, you know, well, okay, I'll try and get it through if you like. And one of the reasons it got through was that Robert Maxwell called the controller in his office and said, It's Bob Maxwell here, Charlie. That sketch is coming out, I'm sure, isn't it? because I'm on the board and Charlie said, no, it isn't Bob. And it went through. So that was very, another very brave thing Charles did because that could have cost him his job. <laughs> <laughs> How do you think Spitting Image built on the satirical foundations of TW3? Well, I'd never seen TW3 at the time. I was away at boarding school. And so that didn't particularly influence me, uh, except in a sort of negative way, because I researched it for Not the Nine O'Clock News. And I thought, well, I definitely don't want to do that. You know, four, four young men in polo neck sweaters and a light, nice little song and a bloke in a tie at a desk. That's not what we wanted to do. 
I mean, obviously it was such an important show at the time, but I think, you know, you're looking in terms of Fluck and Law, they're looking much more to 18th century caricature, you know, Gilray and Rowlandson and Hogarth, very scatological. You know, you can imagine any of those guys doing the Robert Maxwell sketch if he'd been the prime minister at the time or something. So it, you're looking also Punch and Judy is a big, a big spitting image influence. You know, these, it's going way back before television. It's not really like a television show. It's one of the reasons it wasn't popular at the beginning. Is it like, oh, just sort of frightens you. It's like so gross. Um, there was no way of people really reading what the, the sort of grammar of it was really. Um, yeah, and I think, you know, it, TW3, very, very intelligent writing, very thoughtful, you know, quite politically savvy. Spitting image, no, it's Yabu, big nose, isn't it? Yeah, big nose, you've got big ears. And of course, it's very, very effective way of punching up because I've often said, you know, about politicians, you can say you cheated on your tax return, you had an affair with somebody not your, you're not married to, you, um, you lied to the house, they're not bothered. If you say you've got a, you've got big ears, they go, hey, that's a bit, that's a bit below the belt, isn't it? It's not very kind. <laughs> it is, it is extraordinary how playground childishness is, is very effective in terms of, well, you know, famously, David Steele has always denied it to me personally, but the fact that we made him very small, you know, mm. is like. Well, hang on. He used to say, "I'm a, it's totally unfair. I'm half an inch taller than Neil Kinnock." You know, it's kind of th those are the things that hurt. And I know because they made a puppet of me, and I said, "I don't have a pointy head." They said, "Oh, you do. No, oh, yes, you do. <laughs> do I have those bags under my eyes as well?" Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> It's an age-old question and something which is forever being argued and debated about. But as someone who has straddled both sides of the comedy sphere, what is alternative comedy? Well, I think that's a thing that uh, I don't, I'm not sure that there is. I think most people in comedy, like we wouldn't call ourselves satirists, we'd call it topical comedy, you know, or contemporary comedy, really. You know, satire is like saying, I'm, I'm really important or something. And alternative comedy, nobody thought it was alternative at the time. They just thought it was funny comedy. You know, people didn't particularly want to, they'd r run out of enjoying Jim Davidson making jokes about black people, you know, which had lasted fine through the seventies and people wanted to do a different thing. And they wanted to address issues that were important to them. And, you know, the good ones, of course, I mean, when you think about Punch and Judy, Rick and Aid doing the Dangerous Brothers and, you know, which became sort of bottom, it's like, what is alternative about that? It's just people, it's just Punch and Judy again, is it? It's just absolutely silly. Um, and I don't think, I, I, I think the main thing was that, as I alluded to earlier on, that the shift in what was allowable subject matter for comedy and what what attitudes you could have, what side you could take in it, as it were. And um, I was very influenced by going to see a talk at the Edinburgh Television Festival while I was still in radio. I'd been up to the fringe and I'd just dropped into the telly festival. And there was a guy called Gus MacDonald, who was then a, you know, lefty um, programme maker at Granada. Um, and is now a lord, you know, he's now Lord MacDonald. But he was making this impassioned um, speech about stereotyping in sitcom. You know, how everything's very stereotypical, how it's rather sexist, and, and having started off rather sceptical, thinking, what's he know about comedy? He's a documentary guy. I thought, actually, he's got a point here. It's a cliche. So much of sitcom is a cliche, you know, the you know, the sofas and, you know, the drinks cabinets and all that kind of thing, very middle class, very safe. Um, and I thought, you know, that, that, I find that very influential that I'm not actually not being honest. You know, I believe that good comedy is honest comedy and a lot of comedy isn't really honest. It's playing on a set of 
um, preconceptions and, and cliches that you, you need to get better than. Um, so alternative comedy. No, um, I don't, I've never changed my comedy for reasons other than it's not honest and it's not funny. And, you know, I don't have a political position in comedy. I don't think comedy is only funny if it's left wing or only funny if it's right wing. I think it's, you know, I've got a pretty broad sense of humor, but I think sometimes these new ways of doing things make you think freshly, which all comedians must do. All good comics are very bright and they're very, they're innovative thinkers. They look at the world askance. They look at it like a, Arthur Kersler wrote a very good book about it. I was looking at it the other day called The Act of Creation, where he can compares creative scientists to comedy writers and performers. They're all looking at the world as it is. Everyone else accepts the world as it is. Like, well, that's, that's just, yeah, I've got that. But an impressionist, you know, or a caricaturist or a scientist goes, wait a minute, that's not quite right. There, there's a thing there that nobody seems to have noticed, which is why it's so delightful when, you know, let's say a, a, an impressionist or caricaturist or any, you know, co co you know, comedian comes along, Sean Locke comes along and talks about trying to get his kids into the car to go to the seaside. And it's hilarious. Well, you've actually been through it. It's just nothing but annoying to you. And he comes along and makes you see how the funny side of things. And that's going, been going on. You know, I think that the real thing in comedy, sometimes it just stops being funny. I think we're, there's some areas where we're going through a patch where things aren't aren't as funny as they might be. And I think you get a lot of that when political correctness maybe takes over. People are too anxious to, to be outrageous. Um, uh, yeah. Don't know. I don't know the answer to that. Beyond TV, you also had a hand in creating Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Why do you think that it remains such a cult series? I think um, Douglas was such an interesting guy because he could only ever be himself. Um, he tried to be a radio producer and was no good at it. And he tried to do other things than Hitchhiker, work for other people. It never works. He had to, he had this one thing in him, you know, which is Douglas's truth. It's, you know, he's an incredibly original and an interesting guy, but not somebody, you know, I'm a, you know, I can turn my hand to a few things, you know, I'm, I'm a sort of, um, you know, reasonably competent at a, a number of different things, but I'm not a genius like he was, you know, I'm just a comedy plumber, Rowan used to call me, you know, go fix things, you know, yeah, it's a ball cock, mate, that's it, I'll get a new ball cock out for you, I can do that. Um, but Douglas couldn't do that, Douglas can only be Douglas, and it's his truth, that's the thing. Um, and that is the mark of greatness. I mean, I think you see it in all sorts of really well-known people. Andrew Lloyd Webber's like that, you know. I'm not everything Andrew Lloyd Webber wrote is is my kind of cup of tea, but my old PA, Annalisa, had seen everything he'd done four times at least, and she adulated every note. And Andrew's like that, you know, that I once was round at his house. We used to know them quite well when our kids were small. And Andrew, after dinner, sat down to play the piano. And it was one of the most moving and beautiful things I've ever seen. Because when Andrew's playing the piano, you see the kind of angel in him. He's telling this truth and he's passionate about what he does. It's the same when you see Rowan Atkinson driving a car. Not in comedy. Comedy's hard for Rowan. He doesn't really enjoy it. You see Rowan get into a new Aston Martin and the guy becomes a god. He's handsome. He's urbane, he's witty, he's secure, he's happy. You know, when people are in their element, and that's the sort of thing Douglas found in Hitchhiker, a way of self-expression that he wasn't able to find anywhere else. And it, it is true that people, I personally think when you read the books now, which I think two of which are masterpieces, it feels to me very 70s. But a 17 year old doesn't feel like that, it's like, nobody's ever written anything like this before and i think it will go on forever i think it'll go on lasting and you know 
I don't think there'll never be another Douglas. In 2003, you added Panel Show Creator to your CV when you devised the format for QI. Adhering to the Reefian forgive me, adhering to the Reefian principles to inform, educate, and entertain, how did you gauge the series to appeal to the intellectual demographic? Well, so it wasn't the first panel game I did because I started not uh, the news quiz in 77 and quote unquote in 76, which is still running. And obviously the news quiz became, as I'm sure you know, Josh, uh, have I got news for you? So I'd, I'd done a couple of things, um, but QI came out. It's only a panel game QI because I knew what I would have much rather done is do 500 documentaries about the strangeness and, and humorousness of the universe, but I knew I'd never get that. I hadn't worked in television for 14 years between the pilot of QI and the end of Black Adder in 89. I was a commercials director for a long time and also having a massive midlife crisis and wondering what the point of myself was. And I basically spent 10 years trying to bring up small children and also reading a lot and doing ads in the day. And so I read lots and lots of books. And the more books I read, the th everything that I think I know is not true. All the things that I thought I'd learned at university and school are not true. There's, there's more interesting stuff. And I became fascinated by this thing. And I thought, which is the way I've always made uh, telly, it was the way I was trained to make radio and telly, is make something you like. He said, what well, I like. Yeah, you're the producer, make something you like, and at least one person will enjoy the show. That'll be you. If you're any good, a lot of other people will agree with you. But don't ever make a program that you personally despise or don't think is very good on the grounds that working class people or young people or black people will like it because they're less than you. That is disgraceful. And that, 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 has, that, hasn't, that has changed now because now people are trying to... They ask you what you want first and then they give you more of that, whereas we didn't care. We were gonna just do stuff that made us made us laugh. So, um, and I've lost my thread, Ian. Just tip me back to what you asked. Uh, bear with me a second. It was adhering to the Reefian principles to inform, oh, yeah. educate and entertain. How did you gauge the series to appeal to the intellectual demographic? Well, the truth is that I utterly believe in Lord Reith and his principles in the sense that he believed that everybody's smart, they just don't know very much, which is true. And that is the obviously the core Reithian thing behind QI. It's we respect our audience. We love our audience, actually. I like ordinary people. I was a builder for a year in my gap year. I respect my audience and I think, but I'm not gonna to pander to them and say, well, because you don't know very much, we're gonna make ignorant programs for you. We're gonna make great programs that will make you go, whoa, I wish I'd known that before. And I can't count the number of cabbies and, you know, painters and, you know, people who work on tractors who say, oh, I love that QI show. You know, if only Stephen Fry had been my teacher at school, I wouldn't be driving a tractor, I'd be an academic. And that, so, you know, at the beginning, I think the establishment thought, oh, QI is for intellectuals. No, it isn't. QI is for kids and it's for, uh, it's for working class people, uneducated people who are, are very smart. And because I often say, when I was a middle-class boy, you know, uh, public school educated, and I started as a tea boy with an Essex builder, and I didn't half get teased by these guys, you know, because they're all basically, you know, tough working class Tories, all firemen they were in their, in their spare time, volunteer firemen. And of course, because I'd never really met any working class people apart from my mother's cleaner, you know, I thought, well, they're obviously, you know, the sort of what you would have said in the 60s as a public school boy, you know, they're yobbos or whatever it would be, you know. Mm -hmm. And I've worked with these guys for a year. They became obviously very close friends. We're in the pub every night getting pissed and they were all very smart. And I often say, you watch an electrician and a plumber 
rewiring a house and tell me these people aren't very bright. You're, you're making a big mistake, mate. And I lost every argument I ever had with these guys because they were so quick and funny, you know, and it changed my life. You know, it changed my, my view of the world, just these four or five guys. And uh, so I've always made programs for me principally on the grounds that I deserve good programs than anyone else. And, and that I, I can only guarantee that I like this. I can't guess what you, you know, Josh and Ian might like. I've no idea what's in your head, but I can guarantee I like this. And it's again, it's going back to Douglas and Andrew. That's my truth. I find this funny and that has a resonance with some people. Mm. And really the thing is that the fact that it's a panel game that happens, we used to say the idea of QI is to educate, inform and entertain if possible within the same sentence. That's, you know, that's a big calling, but we really try to do that. And um, Marshall McLuhan, the great sort of media guru used to say, anybody who makes a distinction between education and entertainment doesn't know the first thing about either. And so obviously you can imagine because of QI, I'm very interested in education because everyone at QI, I'm the oldest, but going right down to who's the youngest now, Ethan's probably 20, 21. And we've had people younger than him work for us in the past in their teens and certainly lots of work experience people, but everybody who works at QI considers their real education began when they joined the company. Because this is the way everybody should be educated. Every day is fascinating. Every day you learn something. Every day you remember something. Every day you understand a little bit more about the complexity of the universe. And it's not, you know, just a panel game. It happens to be a sort of autodidact, um, you know, a, a way of learning uh, about everything in a way which is painless. So you don't even think you're learning. But two years later, somebody will say, of course, there's no word in English that rhymes with orange. And you go, yes, there is. There's a hill in Abergavenny called the Blorange. <laughs> oh my God, where, where did that come from? It's education by stealth, you know. But again, like spitting images there to entertain you, it's not there to tell you what to think. It's there to, you know, give you fun. And same with QI, we're, there to enter, we're not trying to teach people, but we do teach them by accident. Similarly, spitting image taught a generation of kids politics. And I've often said that, you know, that in 1985, given that it was getting 15 million viewers, any smart 13 year old in the country what's sitting which could name 10 members of the cabinet and four members of the shadow cabinet without thinking about it can you today no, no. i can't i can't name 10 members of the cabinet so we by accident were you know educating people politically and it's true of blackadder i don't know this is all accidental i didn't intend any of this i'm just here to make people laugh blackadder is taught all over the all over the country in schools, you know, secondary moderns, public schools. Yeah. I remember going to see my kids were at Marlborough College in uh, in Wiltshire, and uh, I went to see Harry's teacher, who used to work with me in advertising. He was a marketing director for Unilever, and I went to see him, and I said, Matt, do you by any chance ever show Blackadder in your lessons? He's a history teacher now. And he opened a cupboard and there they all were, every single Blackadder episode. And I, if it's, it's not just him. Um, so again, it's a great way of teaching people, not, to, not the curriculum, but you say, all right, we're gonna do the Tudors. Look, here's a thing. Do you think people really wore those clothes? Well, they did, you know? And, you know, the same with the First World War, you know, it's not, it's a great way of, of giving people a, a better idea of what things are like than reading a dry sort of textbook. He remembers hearing a good quote from Bill Cotton. He said, oh, hmm. 
How can people be informed and educated if there's not entertainment? Yeah, well, I mean, we've um, I've got it here. out go out so we did this this is our box set 10,000 qi facts right mm. 50 quid it's got literally 10,000 facts in it it's a work of genius i think and i believe that if you read that you would be perfectly educated you don't need anything else if you if you in digested that so you know every lesson should be fun now a lot of teachers use these books in class because they start off with an interesting fact and they get the kids interested and once you've got a kid interested you've you've won in 2011 britain lost a comedy legend and you were put forward to present a tribute night dedicated to the legacy of david croft in your opinion how significant was his contribution to british comedy david croft yeah well he was great i mean you know one of the one of the greats and one of the nicest men too a dear man and an utter genius um, list, and a list of credits as long as your arm from I can't even all the war were no, dad, dad's army and you know I mean a great guy and a great an honor to be asked too I must say by his family so but there's so many you know so many from that generation Sid Lotterby just died recently he's another genius in 2017, you appeared alongside Jimmy Mulville and Beryl Virtue in BBC4 Radio 4 Extra series entitled The Comedy Controllers, which celebrated the many landmarks in British comedy. On hearing the clips, what were the aspects of the story which surprised you the most? Oh, well, um, going back to your point, Josh, about alternative comedy, you know, like there's only really one kind of comedy and that's funny comedy. I mean, it's either funny or it's not funny. And it's one of the, the great thing about comedy is high risk, high reward. You know, it's possible to go through a whole career doing soaps or news and not have any real highs or lows, particularly it's sort of in the middle, but it's not possible in comedy. There's nothing more upsetting than something that's trying to be funny and failing, is there? Whereas something that's funny and working is the best thing ever. And that's the thing that stood out for me was how incredibly funny stuff, even before my time, even stuff from the forties, you know, would be, that is really great line. And I, I noticed again, over time, how, you know, it's all slipped. The, the patronizing nature of the way we treat our audiences, they're all a bit thick, which they have never been thick. Yeah. It's just they, they may not know much and that comedy shows that out when you think of some fantastic writing going way back through the 50s and 60s which is great for me because you know i was young in the 60s as a child and we listened to radio all the time and that stuff really stands up and it's as good today it was better than most comedy broadcast comedy they really know what they're doing this cat is so annoying just get off my keyboard peanut off <laughs> this, cat, this cat has ignored me for 20 years nearly and now he has he has he's in love with me it's like really weird he wants to sit on me all the time what is that <laughs> okay uh, 2020 has been a trying year for everyone in your opinion how will the arts recover from covid19 Gosh, I don't know. The culture has a very strange way of, um, you know, the culture's like a sort of underground aquifer, really. And <clears throat> it has a way of flourishing in one corner and then that sort of fades and it suddenly comes up somewhere else. And, you know, maybe the kind of culture we're going to get, it's going to 
reinvent itself as something completely different. I don't know. But we did a very interesting thing with QI. The BBC engineers, bof, wonderful boffins, had invented this thing where you can watch a television show in the studio from home and you watch, you get to watch and hear all those guys, but you also hear all the other people at home. So you've got audience of maybe 400 people all sitting at home alone, but you get the sound in your ears. And I watched one of the QIs like that. It's really good. And actually it works. It's more fun actually than sitting on those very hard seats in the BBC television studio. After two hours, you've got, you know, getting piles and you can sit at home and have a beer, you know, Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. We'll come out and I'm actually talking to somebody who used to <coughs> run Jongleurs, the comedy club. And we're thinking, is, is there a way that we can use some of this technology to make a live experience for comics? Because they've been lonely comics. I was talking to a great friend of mine today. She has just started doing gigs and they've closed it all down again. And she really misses the sound of human laughter. It's like oxygen to her. And comics really need that. So I don't know. I, th you know, there's they'll we'll find a way. You know, it's one of the oddest things about being a person is people can get used to almost anything. Um, and and something will happen. It just won't be the same as it was. I mean, I don't think anything will really ever be quite the same somehow. No, definitely not. Looking back at your career, what's your proudest achievement? Well, I always say the thing that went in parallel to that was that I'm proudest, I, you know, as I often said, I try not to do pride because it cometh before a fall, you know. But if I'm proud of anything, it's um, that I'm still married to the same person that I started out being married to 30 years ago and that I get on really well with all my kids. And that's much part, much more difficult than doing work. I used to think I worked hard until we had kids and I thought, oh no, this is really, this is really hard. And it's also much more important too. It's like, you know, when I started out, originally I wanted to be a crusading defense barrister, you know, an, uh, an advocate and a, um, yeah, sort of Perry Mason. And I'm glad I didn't do that because that really matters. Comedy at the end of the day, you know, if the episode's not very funny, nobody dies. In fact, it's usually the reverse. It's the goodies, isn't it? Who are proud that somebody actually died of laughter at one of their shows. So it doesn't matter. But parenting really matters. And it's very, very much more difficult than <laughs> making any program I've made. So that, that's my answer there. I um, hope it's not too pious, but it's what I think. Uh, yeah. And last question. What's next for John Lloyd? <laughs> well, I'm just doing research for the... S series, which has just been commissioned. So that is the most fun I've had in, oh, it's, it's so great. Spandex and Spain and what else have I been doing today? Um, all the sub-Saharan African countries, just the pleasure of learning for the sake of it, you know, probably it'll produce maybe two questions in the whole series, but there's that. And then uh, my other fun thing is my son's band. He's called Waiting for Smith. He's really good is a brilliant songwriter and I'm his manager, Brian Ego, my name is Brian Ego, very nice to meet you. That, and then if I ever get time is my unwritten novels, you know, cause if uh, Josh may know this, but when Douglas asked me if I'd help him out with Hitchhiker, I said, well, yeah, of course I will mate. Um, anyway, I've been trying to write a novel, a science fiction novel called Jigax and it was like 700 pages long. And I said, have this, you know, you can use any jokes from this if you want. I found it the other day. God, it was terrible. <laughs> but so I have for the last 28 years been sitting on uh, a series of uh, four science fiction novels that I can't finish because I never have seemed to have time. Um, so that would be that's what my wife thinks I should do next. So it'd be kind of closure going all the way back to 78. Yeah. Yeah, 
that might be worth a lot of money in the future. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, no, it's like, you know, um, again, I, I hope these things don't kill us, but the thing is, I've been very fortunate because I, I've always done what I like. I don't, I can't go to work if I can't, I'm just going to get more in the light, can't see me. It's just how lucky am I that some idiot wanted to make me a producer in 1974, because I wouldn't have never said that. I've never wanted to be a producer in my life. I'm a writer and a performer, you know, but somebody saw in me something I couldn't see myself. And so as a result, I've hardly ever done a job that I didn't believe in. And the way I do it is I think, what would I like to listen to or watch on television that isn't there at the moment? And similarly with books, you know, I read a lot of books for QI, as you can imagine, probably seen in, in behind me. And this is the book I want to read. This series, a saga, it's called. It's an epic saga covering the whole of space and time and mm -hmm. it seeks to explain everything about the universe. And I want to know what the answer is. Okay. <laughs> Do you know what that is yet? The answer to life, the universe and everything. Yeah. 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 It's not 42 either. <laughs> it's another completely different number. No, no, I've thought about, I've been thinking about it a lot. Um, and I, I've sort of, if, if Douglas hadn't sacked me and if we had stayed friends, well, we stayed friends, but you know, it was never quite the same. It's sort of, this is the book we might have written. That's, that's, the, that's the thing that keeps me, you know, because an interesting thing about Hitchhiker is that Douglas is very bright and he asked all the big questions. All the big questions are in Hitchhiker, all the things are in Plato and all that kind of stuff, except that Douglas is young and he didn't know what the answers were. You know, he's only 26. You know, so it starts with a big question and it ends with a brilliant joke. And what I want to do is I want to have the big questions, the joke and the answer. Yeah, that's the cherry on the top. The thing is, the reason that this is like this is because of this. And as I say, it's, an, it's now it's a detective story. I don't know all the answers, but I want to allow the characters to tell me uh, where it ends up. Excellent. Uh, yeah, I think that's a good way to end uh, the interview. <laughs> Uh, Thank you very much for your time today, John. Well, thanks, guys. Thanks so much. And um, amazing. Well done, Josh, for doing this. It's a very, very, very uh, good thing you're doing. I really enjoy He really enjoyed researching your career. Oh, thank you. That's so good. That's so good. That's great. So I'm learning trying to learn because my son's living in Amsterdam with his girlfriend at the moment. I'm trying to learn Dutch. And it's rather interesting as I'm, if we were to do this for two more hours, Josh, I'd be able to read you. I have at the moment Ian's translating, but as I get into your grammar, you know, it's like me learning Dutch. You suddenly get, oh yeah, I got, I, I see, I see how it works. Yeah. Very interesting. Yeah. <laughs> That's what everybody says, but you should also hear him when he's drunk. <laughs> <laughs> Makes it <him> difficult. <laughs> yeah. Well, thanks very much, guys. I uh, appreciate it. Thank you very much. Such a pleasure. Oh, yeah, you know. Yeah, uh, Josh will let you know when it goes up on his website and he'll send you a link and all the information, okay? All right, thanks, guys. Brilliant. Take care, all the best. Bye. <laughs>